Welcome to the Performance Formula with Jody Martin. So, Josh, uh, officially welcome to the Performance Formula podcast. It is really awesome having you here. Thanks for having me. Great to uh, great to chat. Yeah, um, we've never met, so I'm I'm really excited. I see some of the things you do on social media. This is the first time of us connecting, and so I'm really, you know, just looking forward to our next little bit that we're going to spend together, chatting cricket coaching mental game whatever whatever it might be sounds good me too yeah um josh i like to start these conversations because they tend to open it up a little bit um if there was something like a formula for performance with all your knowledge all your experience and your expertise expertise and your sort of love of what you do from a wicket keeping point of view and it doesn't have to just be about that but if there was such a thing as a formula for performance what do you think would be key things that should be in that in that formula for athletes, coaches, whomever to consider? No, oh, it's a it's a good question. Um, I suppose you'd want to put it in some sort of uh, like a fire triangle, wouldn't you? Um, where you need all three things. Um, I've just got to think of the three things now. Um, I think I think you're the biggest thing to be um, to be a, a you know a, a top level athlete. Um, but even someone who uh, competes at a at a good level, um, you've got to have that inner drive um, to either succeed or improve. Um, and I think the the drive from within, I think, is probably one of the the most important parts. Um, you can come across a lot of good uh, sports people, but if they don't have that drive. Um, what you'll often find is their ability to improve your effect and actually goes down. Um, and I'm sure, I'm sure we've, we've all seen it at, at some point where we've got, you know, you come across someone who's, who's really good, but just doesn't, um, I don't say almost doesn't care, but you know, there's no, there's, there's a, there's a significant lack of drive. Um, and I think at the, at the highest level, People respond to um, you know, individuals wanting to improve, always wanting to find that little bit that they can get better. Um, that sort of that sort of drive is, I think, is arguably the most important bit. With that, obviously, comes some sort of technical ability. Um, there's, I think, for for what I do, there's got to be a big underlying of the basics. So. Um, I went down to Sussex and um, caught some balls with John Simpson. And he was like, the biggest thing he wants to do is have world-class basics. You know, it's all well and good, um, you know, learning how to ramp shot, let's say, um, and do a lot of like reverse uh, paddles and things like Joe Root does in test matches. That is superb. But you've got to have the basics of getting ahead in line, transferring weight well in order to be able to express yourself in that in that sort of five percent sort of shots um and keeping it's very similar we want to make sure that we can hammer out the basics and be superb at those individual skills so that it allows us to then create and, and you know pull things out of the bag that um others wouldn't if that makes sense um that's two things um i would say the last thing probably comes down to a level of fitness and it's probably something especially uh in a sort of a cricket a cricket sphere um at a you know at the sort of club level that i play i think you can that can often get overlooked um obviously the higher up you go the more s and c coaches and um and physios and things like that get involved um but still i think there needs to be a, an element of um Again, looking to improve, looking to looking to build. I think it can often be um, a question of of maintenance at that sort of highest level. Actually, what you'd want to see is you'd want to see people looking to consistently build, improve numbers and things like that, improve flexibility, improve power. Um, and I think at a, at a club level, um, especially with people who um, you know are looking to push their cricket, but often don't have time um, with work life and things like that. Um, I think tr trying to find a little bit of time just to improve their physical fitness um, and their strength and things like that, um, I think is really beneficial. 
from a from a personal point of view uh i in sort of may time um i got a pt and i've been working with him for the sort of the past six seven months um having not touched the gym for about six years and the difference it made to my cricket over the last season uh was incredible um the the ability to last you know longer as a batter um albeit it doesn't always happen but you know when you're when you are going well um your ability to get past those you know those 30s and things like that um and being able to really push on in to get some big scores um but also you it'd be the recovery the day after um i i don't drink and haven't drunk for um you know maybe about 4 years now but before before going to the gym i'd wake up on sunday and feel like i've been hit like hit by a bus but also have sunk you know 8 to 10 pints um because i'd be so exhausted and now my level of recovery significantly improves because um i think my fitness has improved um and also probably my nutrition to go with that so um i think that plays a really big part as well so uh what did we go for we went for your attitude and willingness inner to drive. push it that's it the you're in a drive to improve um the Some technical the, ability that's it the basics and then that level of physical the, fitness um yeah that's a good triangle i need to it's make not a that bad triangle and, it's and not a stick it on a post <laughs> it's not a bad triangle eh? it's not a bad triangle and I, and I think what i appreciate of your thorough on, answer then in, in terms of your opinion right is so often we think of the formula as one thing. There's this thing that I've got to do, boom, then, or the, the, you know, then there's magic where you sort of covered all the bases, a little bit of mental, a little bit of technical and a little bit of physical, you know, and then you included things oh. like, uh, oh, also has an opinion, agrees with us most probably. No, all good, all good. <laughs> it's, it's the, a letter come through the, the letterbox. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> No, all good, all good. Um, um, you know, so, so I think that if if I if I if I think of that right in my own understanding, like I don't think that's too far off the mark, right? We expect athletes to have a certain level of mental capacity that gets them up, motivated and driven to to succeed and then technically if you're not that strong well then the likelihood of you succeeding reduces and if your physical component is not up to scratch and that includes all those sort of things like recovery and nutrition you know it's easy to think of just okay i gotta run more bench press more squat more whatever it might be but if you're not taking care of the nutrition and the flexibility i think you also mentioned in there I and so my the, sense the is hard part oh sorry yeah. i'm jumping no in. no no fine. Um, I think I think the hard part comes from um, as soon as you enter um, sort of like a county level, say in um, in England, for example, um, all of that is uh, factored in. So you say you've you've joined a um, a county at an under fourteen, under fifteen level, and that then becomes you know your the your s and c is included you've got probably got some sort of fitness plan you've got a nutrition added in you go for a couple of sessions each week um all of that factored in brilliant i think the really tough part comes from those people who are still looking to play at a high level but are not in those in not in those circles and obviously um professional sport um and not just cricket but professional sport um across the board it has a select number and it's also quite ruthless in that nature and as soon as that you are out of that circle you're on your own and uh what i again i don't want to put it on me but in like what i try to create um and the plan in the future is to you know focus on some apps and things like that um the biggest reason i wanted to become the coach that I of what I'm currently doing is because as soon as I left school where you know there was someone on hand who could work with me I was on my own and there was just there was no one to really to help me um progress and the the drive to to do everything on your own 
um, is big. Like you've, it's a, it's a lot. And I think the, what I'm trying to say is, um, it's probably not as easy as just going, oh, well, I want to improve. Um, and then, you know, I'll find time to go to the gym three, four times a week. And, um, I'll, I'll look to have a hit every couple of weeks because it, it, uh, it just doesn't happen like that. Um, and it becomes really challenging as sort of, I suppose, adults who are trying to, you know, really push themselves at a high level, but can't quite um, access those uh, county setups and things like that. Um, it becomes really challenging. Um, so I suppose, uh, yeah, it is, sorry, I'm jabbering, but it's, it, it is hard, isn't it? Um, and I think it's a lot of commitment, especially when you've got, you know, a, a day job where you're working, you know, eight hours a day and um a family and things like that um so yeah and two dogs yeah. like i have who bark, bark yeah. everything <laughs> well or if you like i think of say even just kids at school when they've got to balance maybe other sports when they've got to balance their academics if you're at a varsity you're a 20 20 year old and you're looking to still make it as a pro there's still enough time but to balance your studies with that with the volume that you maybe need at that age that could be quite, it could be quite tough. I'm, I actually know two cricketers who have had them on the podcast, two brothers in the US. I coached them from a young age. They moved there, um, they moved there three years ago and they literally get in the car every morning. Uh, they wake up at like five in the morning. They drive, they stay in Texas where it gets ridiculously hot in summer. So they try and finish their training by 10 o'clock. So they leave early, they drive an hour to net so that they can go throw balls at each other for two hours every day so that they can drive back home for an hour so that they can get into their studies. Um, you know, <laughs> yeah. 19, that, 19, that, 20 year olds, you know? Yeah. Brilliant commitment. Um, but I, uh, obviously that, that is superb, probably not, all, not always viable for some. And I, I suppose the, the route I'm going down is if you, if we're trying to think about that triangle, um, setting yourself achievable targets within that um, and trying to make little improvements in terms of your fitness when you can, your nutrition, um, and then also your basics, um, setting yourself achievable targets when time allows, I think is, is really vital. I don't... Um... I mean, that resonates well with me. How would you think of that? Let's say from a wicket keeping point of view, right? How would you think of small targets from a wicket keeping point of view? If you could give like an example of that. So in terms of, I think you're trying to find, trying to find one time a week um, to train, train new basics, trying to find, probably trying to find someone who can throw balls at you or is willing to throw balls at you is probably the hard part. Um, in the off season, like we are now, once a week, a little top up, absolutely fine. Um, I think your nutrition is probably the easiest bit to look at and trying to get into really good habits. Um, obviously, I'm not a, a nutritionist um, or anything like that. One thing that I found works for me, looking at increasing protein levels. Um, and if we, if you really want to count calories and things like that, my, my current breakdown is 50% carbs and then 25 for protein and fats. Um, and then just trying to fit the gym in when possible. Um, I, don't, I don't think it particularly needs to be, um, you know, you've got to go in for three times a week and spend an hour and a half in there. Um, I think you can do a lot in 20, 30 minutes and going, you know, once or twice a week is perfect. Um, as soon as you start to build habits like that, uh, you know, I'm talking in terms of someone who is starting at nothing. Um, I think just building on that um, and starting with two times a week at the gym, looking to, to try and uh, create some sort of weekly meals that we can take to work. Um, or if we or if we get, you know, if we're catered for at work, looking for breakfast and lunch options, which are consistent. Um, and then you know, trying to find just that little bit of time to trade, I think is perfect. The big, the biggest thing that I found were, uh, that helped for all of my sort of fitness and stuff was just trying to walk 10,000 steps a day. So apart from maybe three or three or four days since 
the start of May, I've walked 10,000 steps every single day. Um, probably, uh, I probably look at it at slightly more of an obsessive level. Um, but the trying to find time just to have a bit of a wander probably is more beneficial um, to your fitness than, you know, trying to really squeeze in a load of gym sessions where you don't really have time. Um, yeah. So take your take your dogs for a walk, take your kids out for a walk, um, or just take yourself out. Um, I think has huge benefits. Yeah, I think not to mention all the mental mental health benefits that you'd most probably score at the same point in time. Absolutely. Yeah. Do you think there's something in that inner drive for elite sort of athletes, those that do make it, that play county cricket and above? or in South Africa, provincial cricket, or Australia state cricket and above. Do you think there are some specific things that you're aware of that, that they have, like where that drive maybe comes from or what it is that they're busy pursuing to have that drive? Or um, is it, uh, you know, just the riches that they can get? Is it the career? Is it the accolades? Is it like, what, what's your sense about that? It's a great question. Um... I think you can get very worked up in comparing yourself to others. Um, and actually, I think probably what they look at is they're constantly looking at themselves. And I suppose you obviously they have the, the pleasure of looking at data and um, video analysis and things like that, which um, you know, others may not. But I think that focus of self and looking at how they can improve rather than looking outwards and going, well, I'm better than them and I'm not playing, but they are. So how's, how does that, how is that fair? Um, because how are you going to, what are you looking to improve from that? Um, because you, if you already think you're better than them, you're not going to, you're not going to train at a level that is going to improve you. You're going to look, well, I'm already better than them. So actually, um, I'll just have a bit of a hit or I'll catch some balls or whatever. Um, and that's that. So actually looking at a bit of self-reflection um, probably goes back down to the mental side of things again um, and being honest with ourselves, um, working with people, with coaches and going, actually, what do, what do you think that I need to look at? Um, and then, again, looking at just trying to be that 1% better each time. Um, I think that's that's probably the thing that could separate, um, you know, the, the real top level um, of players from others. Um, but that, that inner, inner focus and looking at how they can improve rather than trying to compare yourself um, to others that you play with, um, I think is massive. I think that's great advice, right, for anybody listening. I think in any sphere of life, really, right, comparing all it does is really breaks us down, makes us feel like we're not good enough, creates doubts, all of that sort of thing, you know. So I, I, it resonates well sort of with my thinking and my understanding too. I think you end up resenting um, others as well. Um, and that's just going to, that's good. It's going to ruin your, um, your enjoyment of that team environment. Um, mm. Because obviously it is a, especially at the top level, and uh, I, I assume that your sort of provincial stuff is very similar to um, our sort of county level in its ruthlessness, because there's only there's only a certain amount of people that can make the squad. Um, actually, if you're constantly thinking about um, trying to be better than, than so-and-so and, um, you know, worrying about, you know, are you going to make the squad and things like that, um, it's just going to ruin your progress. And it's going to ruin your enjoyment as well. And arguably, those are probably the two things that, that you want to get out of being in a, a system like that is loving the game, whatever game that might be, and looking to improve. And as soon as you're comparing, um, is, it, uh, is it the comparison is the thief of joy? Is that one of the, is that a phrase? Um, I don't know that, but it sounds familiar. Um, uh, that could be, that's far too intelligent for me if that's, if that is a thing. Um, Same. But I, yeah, but quote that. Um, but it's, it's exactly that. If you're constantly comparing yourselves to others, then you're going to just lose any enjoyment you have because all you're thinking is how you need to, you need to be better than them. 
Um, and so you're looking at what they're doing and you're going, actually, well, I, I want to do that because that's what they're doing. And if I'm better than them, then I can get into whatever. Um, but taking a bit of a step back and just thinking about yourself um, makes you enjoy whatever game you're playing is more. Enjoy being around the team because at the end of the day, you'll start being more supportive of others because you're looking at, you're looking at it from um, a self-improvement point of view. So actually you can then encourage the other people for then looking at their sort of self-improvement style of things. Um, and then the team harmony just becomes so much better. Um, there's, you stop complaining at each other. Um, you stop, again, like we say, comparing one another and you just look at what's the most important thing and that's improvement, working together as a team and enjoying it. Yeah, it, re it reminds me of these ideas of like, you can't pour from an empty cup. You know, like I think if you're comparing consistently, then you're essentially emptying your cup. You're not you're not filling it where where if you're going off to self-improvement, it's like I'm filling my cup, filling my cup, filling my cup. And so I can pour from this to others. There's the flip side of that that could say, well, it can become very selfish then. You know, I'm only in this for me and my benefit. So I think there might just be some uh, tricky waters to navigate that you that you that you can sort of take on the sense of I want to improve myself and yet at the same point in time as you say be there for be there for others be there for the team you know my my uh, one friend and I we busy um uh we create we earlier in the year we did a whole series on where we followed the South African cricket team at times we were a little bit critical about the perils of world cup success in South Africa at times we were a little bit uh uh deep and dark about some stuff in our history and things like that as south africans um and so we're looking to we, we're sort of busy doing another series called spirited cricket where we're trying to shine the light on the the brighter side so as to speak you know like what other things we can do to um make the game more enjoyable what are the things we can uh what are the things we can do to play within the right spirit essentially and one of the things he mentioned, which which sort of completely uh, caught me off guard in the moment was he spoke and you sort of alluded to it now. Right. Um, which says to me, you know, we in that in those conversations, we may be on to something there is that that it becomes about the relationship. That's how, you know, you're doing things in the right spirit. If relationships break down, then the then the spirit can't be good if relationships are enhanced you know, then the spirit of the game will always be in a better place. And that's sort of a way that you could potentially measure that. And so I suppose if you come in comparing and or thinking you're better than others, you know, even that's a comparing because you're judging yourself as higher than others, then I don't see relationships flourishing. Or I don't see you being able to let relationships flourish. Um, yeah, so I, I think that's pretty awesome, you know, that we get maybe a little bit technical in those conversations. Where, where you and I just having a nice chat, but it sort of alludes to, <laughs> it alludes to the same thing, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me, uh, Josh, technically, right? So that's the second part of your pyramid. Um, what, what do you think? And you talk there sort of about the, the basics in particular. What for you are the basics of the game? Like what is, or, you know, even if it's just wicket keeping, you know, like what, what are the basics? From a from a keeping standpoint, um, I think having a a strong setup, a very sort of athletic and powerful setup, um, both stood up and stood back, um, are probably. Are you for like really, half, really half semi semi? Are you um, if you speak strong, it sort of creates a sense of staticness in my head. And so I just want to check, are you for sort of it being fairly still or are you the type of coach that says, nah, it's the more mobile touch go sort of um, approach? Good question. Um, and probably poor phrasing from me. Um, I think, yeah, so a very powerful setup is, um, is probably the one that you want. Um, for me, it's all about having a good squat position. Um, I think if we're looking at, I, I pre predominantly do about 80% stood up work um because i feel that's usually the the thing that keepers struggle with um and arguably it's it's one of the things that you want to be your best at because you can make such an impact stood up to the stumps um 
in terms of in terms of that setup, um, if we're looking at um, going real technical and going numbers wise, we want about a ninety degree angle with um, with our knee bend, um, which allows for our quads to really start to work. Um, and you think about the size of our quad muscles; they are they are such a powerful um, collection of muscles that we want to use them as much as we physically can. Um, as soon as we start to dip down and our hips start to fall below our knees, um, we start to get a little bit stuck. Um, and that style of keeping is still is still around. Um, I feel it's quite an old school way of doing it. Um, and obviously, I, as soon as I mention things on um, Instagram or post um, whatever about setup, there's always a level of um, sort of judgment and um, and sort of bite back about about that sort of thing. But from a from a personal point of view, what I'm looking to do is make things as powerful as I can. And if we're looking to engage our quads, which we ideally are um, as much as physically possible, um, that 90 degree knee bend um, and having our hips and our knees in line um, allows for the most powerful position that we can get into. Um, I like what you said about sort of um, touch and go. So for, from a, from a stand up point of view, as, especially um, what I'm looking for is looking to touch down with our fingertips, just as that ball is about to be released, we touch down and then we can rise with that ball. Again, everything comes from our quads. We're always looking to drive up um, with our legs. Um, and what I often see is people get stuck in their sort of squat position, especially if they're too low. So what ends up happening is your hands are the thing that, that rises first. And so you end up in a position where you're pointing your fingers at the ball um, and you're catching with no catch surface area visible to the ball at all. Um, sorry, deviating from the path of touch there. But um, it was a good question. And yeah, so we're looking for, for powerful and agile. Um, if you're thinking about, um, from a stood back point of view, um, someone spoke to me and said, if you try and jump as high as you physically can from a, a, for a, a squat position um, start, and you're looking to jump as high as you can, the moment that you're just about to rise up is your perfect uh, setup position stood back. And what you'll find is that, that your, your hands aren't touching the floor um, in this scenario. And I think because stood back, even in probably England's probably a, a good example of it, because especially sort of the club club wickets, because especially this season, it's been so wet. Um, wickets haven't really had a chance to dry. So you get a lot of low bounce and things like that. Um, even on pitches like this, I think being in a nice, powerful squat position um, where we are not touching the floor, I think is absolutely fine. The way you, whenever you go to places that have decent tracks, um, I can imagine South Africa is a good place for decks, um, Australia especially, um, I think from an efficiency point of view, getting your, in a, getting in a low squat position, which I see a lot, especially in Australia still, getting in a low squat position with hands to the floor when you're stood back, it's an absolute waste of time. Um, because whilst, yes, you are rising with the ball, which is good, you've got so long to see it. And often you're going to be taking balls up here, um, chest high and above, that you're creating such effort for yourself. Um, and if we think about, you know, especially in Australia, your, your sort of um, uh, club games um, end up being uh, two days. You know, you play the Saturday and the Saturday. And if you're keeping for 90 overs, having to go all the way down to all the way back up um, against the seamers who will bowl, you know, sort of 30 odd overs that day is a lot of work. Um, so trying to be as efficient as we can is, is probably the, is the key in that sense. Um, but again, that's, that's probably quite a contentious issue, which I, dis which I discuss regularly on my, um, on my socials. Um, and a lot of people disapprove and disagree, but in a, when you've got that much time to watch the ball, you're always able to drop. Um, ben Folks, perfect example, arguably one of the best keepers around at this moment in time. Um, 
if you ever watch him stood back, um, he's very big on his hip hinge. So he won't squat down. He'll actually keep his legs relatively straight, but he'll bend his hips um, significantly more. So his chest is, is almost angled towards the floor. He stands further back than any keeper um, in, the, in the sort of circuit in England. Um, and it's because he knows that he can fall well. And actually, his ability to get to, get to the floor um, is good enough that he can then, if for anything that's low or on its way back down, all he has to do is drop to the floor and gravity does the rest. Um, I'm losing my tangent here. Um, no, all good, <laughs> all good. Just so, away. So, so maybe, maybe, maybe let me interject. So, so I think the things that you said there that I um, uh, agree with is especially like I think, and we talk about it often in South Africa as coaches that if we get our keepers to sit all the way down and they go to stand all the way back up because the ball's going to bounce hip height or higher consistently, and so we. I lean towards sort of, so this, my next question would be around routines, right? Because I lean towards, as you say, stood back, um, the keeper actually touching the ground with their hands lightly and still rising with the ball, but not necessarily sitting down there too long, you know, not like sit there and wait, 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 because I agree then they struggle to move from that position. So you struggle to start going sideways and you end up lunging or you have to jump for balls that are not too wide from you. Like, what is your sense about, say, the rhythm or the routine that wicket keepers need? You know, because if you look at a guy like Gilchrist, sort of, I don't know why, but in my, or uh, uh, Ian Healy, uh, where they have this rhythm, they would stand up quite tall. You know, the bowler would start their run up. The closer the bowler comes, they would sort of step into their spot, go down, touch the ground lightly, and then get up. My sense was always that makes the movement more dynamic. Um, you know, what's your sense about like the rhythm or the routine that wicket keepers need? And hey, it could include some mental stuff too. I'm happy to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, so if we break it down from from stood up and stood back, we go stood up. Um, the I think I think trigger movements play a really important part in keeping. Um, for for me, um, and what I I look to um, sort of suggest to others is I start with my hands um, on my knees um, when I'm stood up, when I'm waiting for the bowler to come in, um, trying to drive my head forward. So I think I try and keep my shoulders past my toes. Um, so all of my weight is driving forwards. Um, I usually take two very small steps forward, one with one step with my right, one with my left. I drop down, like you say, as the as the bowl is about to release the ball, I touch the floor and then I'm coming back up. Um, we're looking to make that squat explosive rather than just like you say, rather than just sit there. Um, I often see keepers who will get in a squat position and will just wait. Um, and I'm thinking the only the only two things that are going to come of that is one, you're either going to start to rise too early because your legs are on absolute fire because you're essentially trying to do a wall sit for 30 seconds every ball. Um, or your weight will start to fall backwards um, as you start to get tired. So um, being explosive and dynamic in that is very important. Um, stood back, and we'll talk about the, the mental side in a second. Um, stood back, I'm a, I'm a bigger trigger movement person here. Um, again, I'll start with my hands on my knees, um, over my pants. Um, again, just trying to drive my weight forwards. Um, I take one step forward with my left foot and then it becomes um, a split step, essentially, if you think about from a fielding point of view. Um, I, I want to be as dynamic as someone who's walking in from backward point. So if you think about watching A.B. de Villiers um, all those years ago, um, he'll take a couple steps in. A little split step, right, left, left, right, um, and then boom, he's able to move wherever he needs to go. Um, I think getting into really good habits with that, I think, is key. Um, nice and light on our feet. Um, I'll go left foot, right, left, and then I try and get to that position just as that ball is about to release the ball. 
and then I'm away, looking to move wherever that wherever that ball goes, trying to get my head as close to the line of the ball. Um, if oh, I was going to say something, I can't remember, but, but um, it'll it'll come back to me. The um, the the key thing I think in terms of from a mental point of view um, is allowing ourselves to just switch on and switch off. Um, I often will catch a ball, throw it to someone, and then I'll look to have a conversation with someone, um, either shout some sort of encouragement um, or some sort of um, hilarious um, criticism to another fielder or something. Um, I'm deviating from the path slightly, um, but something that I think is important to raise is what um, what a sort of keeper's job is vocally. Um, and I think your your team works most effectively when there's an element of support, um, especially from the person, um, quote unquote, beating the drum, as you'd say that a keeper probably is. Um, the the level of enthusiasm, I think, and encouragement, I think is really important, um, especially as you sort of see the game quite, quite clearly from your standpoint. So you see everything that's going on. Um, and I think between catching balls, making sure that we are looking to consistently encourage our team, um, I think is really important. Um, one thing I really dislike is any sort of sledging, um, especially when it's um, it, it's it's just really um, quite cruel and nasty um, towards batters. I don't think there's any benefit in that, um, especially when you're playing club level. Um, I think, uh, especially at the level that I play at, we've all paid we've all paid a tenner to play the game on a Saturday. I don't need someone um, at Gully giving me abuse for no real reason um, because I don't think it enhances either of our games. Um, that anyway, that's that's from my personal standpoint. Um, but I'm deviating again. Anyway, don't I don't disagree. <laughs> I, don't, I think we're in charge of the experience we want. Right? In terms of in terms of the ability to be able to switch on and off, um, I think is quite key, and I think it can be quite difficult, especially if. Someone asked me, um, I did like a and a thing on my Instagram um, this morning, and someone asked me about trying to juggle um, being a keeper, uh, batting at three, and also captaining the side. Um, and it then becomes even more challenging to, to switch off between different elements, especially if you're trying to captain at the same time. Um, you almost have to have two modes that you go into where when the ball is coming then the ball is running in you're thinking right i need to watch the ball that from a the most effective point of view i find is just me telling myself to watch the ball um especially when stood up because if if you stood up against seam i find that it can often be quite daunting you know with a, a bowler coming from the top of their run um and all you you'll end up thinking is God, this guy, he runs in fast, isn't he? Um, and then you're starting to panic a little bit and you'll get a little bit more jumpy and things like that. Whereas all I'm thinking is, this is the ball that I'm going to catch. Almost as if someone's feeding a machine and it's just you and the ball. Um, and I find that really works when you're trying to almost dehumanize this this thing that's happening and just go right i need to watch the ball i'm going to watch the ball into my gloves ball comes i've watched into my gloves i've thrown it away i can now relax for 20 seconds i can shout some encouragement i can talk to my teammates um i can make a, a joke that no one finds funny who uh criticizing one of the guys who's at mid-off who's just dropped a very simple underarm from cover um you know and being able to to balance that is tough, um, but I think if you're thinking in terms of um, mental stamina for 45 overs, 50 overs, if not a whole day in the dirt, um, being able to just switch on, switch off, um, I think is really important. Um, so to, to, to recap, um, I think a small trigger, um, looking to always drive our weight forwards in a stood up point of view. Um, I think from a stood back point of view, driving forwards is really key as well. We're always going to try and get our head 
driving forward so the weight stays on the balls of our feet. Um, but from a stood back point of view, you can have a slightly bigger trigger. Um, I know there was something in the laws all about um, trigger movements for keepers and stuff like that. Um, because someone saw it as an unfair advantage or whatnot, which is a load of rubbish in my opinion. Um, so as long as you're not, I think the issue was is that people were standing back and then taking about 10 steps forward to get close to the stump so that they can you know, um, create some sort of stumping chance. Um, that is obviously um, completely fair, but you taking two steps forward and not getting in the baddest way or not trying to change the outcome of that particular ball, um, I think is absolutely harmless. The the big one who actually I notice is awful at their trigger movement, um, but gets out of it by being um, incredibly athletic is Quinton de Kock. Um, and if I, I don't know if, you're, it, if you're watching, if you watch him keep his, his trigger movements are so varied in terms of their timing. Um, that you think there is no way that he he should be able to catch what he does but his athleticism is incredible and so he's able to pick up these balls out of absolute nowhere diving from almost a stood up position um and pulling off these absolute worldies um so here's yeah. the anomaly in that yeah so i think a lot of what you say as i'm listening to you is it speaks to there is the basics, but there's also the individuality. You know, like you spoke about, um, oh man, I forgot the keeper's name. I got an image of his head, uh, of him in my head. The keeper uh, from John England. The, no, the, uh, the one that Folk. you spoke. Yeah, folks, sorry. Yeah. Um, you know, in, in how he does things different, you think of a guy like uh, Jack Russell that used to keep. And then you think of the Australian keepers, they all tend to keep in a similar way. Then you think of someone like Doni, who's completely, I think he defies a lot of the, the, the sort of is, the basics essentially in how, how he used to catch. Um, you know, I have, I have one more technical question here yeah, that sort of popped in my head. Yeah. Um, and this is something that I, I don't know, right? If you think of standing up, are you a head first or hands first to go down leg? Great question. Um, I'd argue that both of them play a role um, as long. So this is a, a good point from a from a coaching point of view. Um, again, I'm trying to think of the most efficient way that we can keep. That's what all of my all of my posts on my social media come down to. Um, like you say, it's absolutely correct. Everyone's going to be slightly different. We're all going to have an individual way of doing a certain skill. Um, but from my point of view, I'm trying to think of how efficient can I be as uh, a wicketkeeper and how best can I explain things as a coach, especially for people who um, are starting out as keepers, how best can I explain it and get them to succeed in a task uh, that can be then repeated successfully. So leg side work for me comes um, from, I suppose, head, my argument is head and hands both go. But obviously your hands will end up getting there first because there's a lot more reach than there is ability to get across with your head. What needs to go with that is our weight transfer. So your weight gets across as well as your hands and your head. And then as we get across and make that catch, our feet then start to go. I train it and coach it that way because I try to avoid that left foot step integration. The reason for that is as soon as you include that little left foot step, and often sometimes, sorry, there's a, there's a, I don't know if you can see that, it's a paw that's just appeared. Um, the, the, the left foot step becomes a tricky thing to get consistent because after a while, when it, it may start small, as you get more tired, that step will start to grow because you'll stop snapping and just start to take that step. Um, and then that will be your, well, I'm across now. Um, so what I'm trying to do is trying to go head and hands first, catch that ball. And then just as we catch that ball, we're looking to snap across with our feet 
as we snap across our hand can then go back to the stumps almost in a sort of a counterbalance mm. sort of motion yeah, yeah 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 i get all of that and that makes so much sense so much sense because i've been of the sort of whenever i've coached wicket keeping moving down leg i would focus a little bit on the feet you know that little small step as you say the little small step and then a little shuffle because i find then it speeds the feet up it makes the feet go quicker but i love what you're saying because it it's most probably the more important part is that your head and your hands get there because you need to see it and you need to catch it. It doesn't matter how quick your feet are. If your head stays behind or your hands stay behind, then you're not going to catch it. So get the important stuff there and then the feet can catch up. And then I, get, I completely get the sort of counterbalance thing. And I love that it's a both and and not an either or in your, in your reply. <laughs> You know? I think I think that's what works best. I think as soon as you think, oh, well, I'll go hands first, you'll go hands, but your head mm. stays still. And yes. actually, all that, all that means is that if your head stays still, your weight then can't get across. And actually, you've only got that far. You can only reach that yes. far. If you don't move anything yeah. else, that's your limit. Whereas yeah. as soon as you transfer your weight, your ability to reach um, further increases significantly. So... Yeah, it definitely comes with going with both and then snapping across. Um, to be fair, one of the okay, I'll go back to work uh, doing some bits with uh, John Simpson down in Sussex. What he does, which I really enjoyed, was the left foot ended up being um, it ended up being more of an opening in order to allow his hip to get across and access that side than a step. So actually, it just became a turning of the foot that just allowed him to really push off and then open up a touch um, as mm. he worked his way across. That did I that like not, as well. Did that not cause him to almost like get into a running position rather than a shuffling yeah. position? You're, you're right in that sense in that you run the risk slightly of as soon as that foot opens up, the likelihood of you finishing like that and going a little bit further down leg and backwards yes. can increase. Um, so it ends up being a, you know, having a sort of condition yourself in to try and still make sure that you're working laterally and not mm -hmm. backwards as well um, is quite important. That's a really good point made. Um, for me, I'm always looking to try and encourage keepers to keep their feet pointing down the wicket, um, either when, uh, we're digressing a bit, but, you're, you're looking at two movements when you're stood up to the stumps. Leg side is one of them and uh, an offside step just to access those really wide balls is the second. Everything else can be done with transferring of weight from foot to foot. I don't think you need to move anywhere else because ev everything else can be covered just by transferring your weight to get your head and hands in line. Um, but whenever we do move in order to stay on the balls of our feet, we want to try and keep those feet pointing down um, the wicket so that everything, again, just drives forwards. Um, that's another basic that we can throw in. Just always looking to drive forwards is the key. Yeah, yeah. one of the things you didn't mention now that I often notice is if we focus, focus on feet is that you get that big lunge down leg. So it's almost like the foot goes first and then the head and the hands are still on the offside of the batter and then it it ends up being quite messy down leg because now you can't move. You've sort of locked your body into a position. Absolutely. And if you think about, if as soon as you go with that big left foot, let's say if we're going down to a right-hander, um, what ends up happening is you end up getting stuck behind the batter for longer. And actually you're then, especially when it's a spinner, it may seem like a really good shout to try and get there early. But actually all you end up doing is being blocked by the batter for longer to the point where you're having to make a reaction catch from the moment you see that ball again after it's past the after it's past the batter and that is a minute period of time and that is the classic panic zone where you're then not sure where the ball is where the ball is so immediately as soon as you don't know where the ball is you're you're starting to stand up because there's no way you're um, it's, a, it's like, almost like a fight or flight thing. If you're not sure what's happening, you're getting out of there. Um, so as soon as you take that huge left foot, 
you end up rising, you end up losing the ball for longer. Whereas if we're trying to be really fast with our, with our snap across, um, it allows us to be on the offside for longer and everything moves quickly together in order to minimise the amount of um, blocking of vision that the batter will, um, will give you. Um, and then just maximising the amount of chance that you have to identify length, line, um, and also just getting across. Josh, I feel like this conversation can continue for another hour, eh? Like I've, I'm, I'm, I'm loving this, but I'm aware that you've got some other things to do. So, uh, so have I. Um, you've obviously referenced your sort of social media quite a lot. Um, you know, if people want to reach out to you, whether they're in the UK or I'm, I don't know if you do any online type stuff. Um, you know, what's the best ways in which people can connect with you? Great question. Um, so all of my all of my social medias. Um, are at underscore the WK coach. Um, the best, the best sort of route of option is um, sending me a, a message on Instagram um, with questions and things like that. Um, yeah, just ping me as many questions as you can because you know I'll, I'll I'll definitely answer them. Um, online online coaching sort of yet to come, but the the plan is to um, create a devoted app to everything sort of wicket keeping based. Um, looking at um, the basics like we've gone through drills, um, looking at equipment, looking at gym workouts, um, you know, a lot of mobility and power stuff as well. Um, that's the plan. That's what's to come, hopefully, um, at some point next year. Um, but yeah, the Wicked Keeping Coach, I'm on all social medias. Just find me, follow me, like everything. Yeah. Awesome. And I, I, I will attest to that. That's how you and I connected was via Instagram. So uh, definitely know that you are responsive on that and you'll, you'll um, happily take questions. That's, that's good to know. Josh, thank you very much. Eh? Like I said, I've really enjoyed this conversation. I think we could have gone on longer. Um, I really appreciate your time and your willingness to share so openly and so freely. Pleasure, man. Apologies for, for dogs barking. Oh, uh, no, um, I wanted to, get, I wanted to say, me. I wanted to say, what's the dog's names? We can give them a little shout oh. out. Hobbsy, Hobbsy, come here. So this is, uh, this is Hobbs. Oh, um, nice. He's a, he's a little cats. cockapoo. He's a, he's a toy cockapoo. Yeah, try chasing cats. Phil, come here. And Phil, nice. And I've got, I've got Phil. He's, he's a bigger cockapoo. There you Brilliant. go. There we go. Good boy. Um, awesome. Yeah. The terrible twosome, but yeah, they're um, they're yeah, great man. lads. So everybody watching, those are the voices you heard behind the scenes. They also want to talk wicket <laughs> keeping. <laughs> yeah. They love they love a bit of catching. Um, love a tennis ball, bit of tennis ball work, um, mainly so that they can eat the felt off it. Yeah, of course. <laughs> awesome. Thank you very much, Josh. Thanks, mate. Appreciate it.